Are you upset? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Melon Regis Savetta, and as co-chair of the Rainbow Ministry, hold it up, sorry. I'm co-chair of the St. Cecilia's Rainbow Ministry, and I just want to welcome everyone here tonight from near and the far. We understand there are people on our live stream, so we really have to get going. Um, Father James Allison, was born in the UK and brought up in a conservative Anglican family. He went to Eton College and at 18 joined the Roman Catholic Church. He was studying Spanish and history at New College of the University of Oxford when he went to, um, to Mexico as an exchange student. And then after that was over, he joined the Dominicans in Mexico. He completed his novitiate in England at Blackfriars, Oxford. In 1986, he took part with the English Dominicans to propose Catholic pastoral involvement with AIDS. In 1987, he went to study at the Jesuit Theology Faculty of Brazil and was ordained in 1988. Between 1990 and 94, he worked on his PhD and completed it successfully. Since 1995, James has remained a priest, though not incarnated in any diocese. I'll let, as they say, I'll let him fill you in on the rest of the story, if he chooses. Father is not only well known for his writings on Rene Girard, but also for his insights into the LGBTQ experience in the Catholic Church. Many years ago, or as it is referred to now as pre-COVID, Father Allison came to the Jesuit Urban Center and gave us a weekend retreat. I remember it as all who were there do, as an absolutely amazing weekend. We were complaining about the election of Benedict as Pope. And his words to us were, be patient, give him a chance. Of course, his papacy led us to our wonderful Pope Francis, who has personally contacted James with words of support. I hope you all are as thrilled as we are tonight to be able to welcome with us Father James Allison. Well, good evening. 
And thank you very much, Mellon, for a lovely introduction. And I need to ask you, Jeff, if I'm in the right place. I am in the right place, good. <laughs> um, I'm a Brit, as you can probably guess, uh, which means that mm, ideally I speak like this. So if my voice lapses, please make suitable gymnastic gestures, YMCA, things like that, so as to call me to uh, pronounce my words a little bit more, more clearly. Well, having talked with, uh, with Mellon, uh, I thought I'd try and talk a little bit about the state of things uh, in our beloved church with relation to matters LGBT this evening. Does that seem a, a suitable subject? Yes? So, good. Well, that's, that's what we'll do. Um, a little bit of a run-up, because one of the things which I found over time is how limited people's sense of history is. I don't know whether that would be true uh, here. But after fiducia supplicans, which I, I'm, I hope I will uh, suggest is actually going to mark quite a significant before and after, um, one of the first things that happened, of course, was different cultural reactions from different parts of the world, as you noticed. Um, very sort of hardly anything at all from North American <laughs> Episcopacy, no great surprise there, except kind of, well, not really wanting to say anything, um, while trying to sound loyal but not saying anything. Um, uh, but uh, a, a pretty crazy outburst from Africa. I don't know whether you read uh, Cardinal Ambongo's statements, but it was it could have been written by a mixture of a, a Putin apologist and an American evangelical uh, preacher. Uh, it, it didn't seem much have much to do with the Catholic faith uh, either way, but it was indicative of a kind of reaction uh, in Africa. So. What I'd like to do is just part of building us up for what is to come. It's just a tiny little bit of historical background, remembering how recent it is in our history that we learnt something true about being human with relation to matters LGBT. Remember that it wasn't really until the 1950s that the medical profession and the psychologists began to be able to see for the first time absolutely clearly that there was no pathology intrinsic to being, at that particular time it was the L and the G rather than the B or the T that they were uh, 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 looking at. But that's a very recent discovery in historical terms. And it's a, it's a discovery that took several hundred years to make. And as far as we can tell, the reason for the discovery was the invention of heterosexuality. That seems a weird thing to say, because it suggests that maybe babies were born with storks uh, before the 17th century. It's not entirely true, of course. Uh, the biological mechanics haven't changed that much but what happened in the 17th century? Well, the historians refer to it as the invention of companionate marriage. Does that ring a bell? The notion of people getting married because they liked each other, rather than principally for reasons of kinship, protection, property, uh, honor, other things like that. The notion that people should get married to the person whom they liked, who was going to be their best friend for life, that started in the 17th century. And it's one of the great innovations of Western culture. And it is a complete innovation. We now look at a hardline Islamic culture and see how separated uh, the women and the men are from a fairly young age. Uh, as infants, they can play with each other, but then after a bit, the girls get brought up amongst the women and the boys get brought up amongst the men. And interchange between the two is 
vi very strongly invigilated. <laughs> uh, and marriage is often organized. There's a huge, often a very big age gap between the women and the men uh, in marriage. And remember that that's how much of humanity has worked much of the time. What's odd for us is the recognition that we are odd by the standards of the rest of the world. What seems natural to us is odd in historical, in historical terms. And it was after the invention of companionate marriage and the beginning of the collapse of what the sociologists call a homosocial society, homosocial, where people are basically brought up amongst the same sex, <laughs> into, it was the, the gradual collapse of that, that for the first time something became visible which is not visible in a homosocial society. In a homosocial society, where men are brought up amongst men and women are brought up amongst uh, women, everything is a huge don't ask, don't tell. No one actually minds what your subjectivity is, provided you do the right thing, get married to the right person at the right time and have the requisite number of children. That's really what matters. What do you do on the other side? Psh, psh. Let's try not to make too much of a fuss about that. Don't ask, don't tell. Which is why you may remember some years ago the, the then president of Iran called Ahmadinejad said there are no gays in Iran. Do you remember that? And everybody laughed. Uh, and they were right to laugh. But in one sense, he was saying, we have a homosocial society in which there isn't heterosexuality in the Western sense. So such things are invisible. <laughs> it is quite literally the don't ask, don't tell uh, world. Now, it was from the 17th century onwards that as the heterosocial world began to develop, so people like us, LGBT people, started to become visible because we didn't know how to play the rules of the new game. <laughs> okay, <laughs> in the old homosocial world, no one would have noticed. In the new world, it becomes clear that there are these weird sort of people who just are like that, or they seem to be dangerous and have meetings in strange places and have funny walks where they meet each other. Perhaps they're spies. In the case of 17th century England, perhaps they're papists or Jesuits or sodomites. Because of course, papists, Jesuits, sodomites and traitors were considered to be the same, the same thing <laughs> at, the, at the time. Weirdos who didn't go along with the new Protestant order and the king and all of that. So these were suspect people. And what has really has happened over the last 400 years is the gradual collapse of the suspect class. <laughs> In other words, people having been treated as potential scapegoats because weird in ways that no one quite understood. There must be something criminal with them, something conspiratorial. That's why they've got caught up in this. And then with the development of medicine in the 18th century, people began to say, okay, maybe there's something sick about them. Maybe it's an illness. They couldn't find a, an illness to, to label us with. And then we drifted into the 19th century. All the while, uh, considerable violence could be exercised. Remember, people could be hanged, uh, flogged, or whatever in uh, uh, our respective countries. Those of you who, there's a quite little entertaining little um, vignette from Ireland, given that this great Irish city in which we're in, um, uh, sodomy and uh, homosexuality wasn't punished in Ireland at all. But when the, when the English invaded and took over, uh, it was good Protestants, they decided they needed to impose um, uh, hard line on all these sorts of things. And the first person to be hanged in uh, Dublin uh, for sodomy was the Anglican Archbishop who had himself brought in the legislation against <laughs> sodomy. There you are. Which goes to show that uh, ecclesiastical closet queens um, uh, <laughs> are not only a thing of the 20th and 21st century. <laughs> 
all of which is, anyhow, just to give you a little, little example of uh, the history of these things. Um, but in the, 19th, in the 19th century, even though the legislation still continues to be very violent, actually the last people in England to be hanged for buggery was 1835, I think. It was recent, so it stopped relatively early uh, in the 19th century. That was the last hanging uh, for this, but there were many other sorts of punishment and imprisonment and so forth. Um, famously, Parliament, British Parliament attempted to introduce legislation uh, to include women in the crimes uh, of sodomy um, because there was no legislation about women. And Queen Victoria uh, refused to sign it on the grounds that it was impossible. She claimed, it's impossible, nothing can happen. Therefore, I refuse to sign this legislation. So thanks to her prudishness, um, <laughs> lesbianism remained off the, off the statute books <laughs> in the British Empire, unlike, unlike sodomy, which throughout the British Empire, apart from your bit of it, uh, where you had even tougher sodomy rules because of your Puritan uh, past. <laughs> um, uh, the British, British rules throughout Africa and India and Australia until way into the 20th century. Uh, yeah, I mean, in some cases into the 21st century, given the African countries which still have the British, the British sodomy laws on their books. But in the 19th century, we began to get obviously the beginnings of psychology. And so people started looking at this in a different way. And by the end of the 19th century, the, the key year is 1869, famously uh, a Hungarian activist of some sort, he was fighting against the Prussian sodomy laws, invented the term homosexual for the first time to try and describe a sort of person. Because of course, previously everything had been to do with acts. There had been no understanding in medical or psychological terms that there was just a certain sort of person who was this way. It was always a question of what is wrong with these people that they do these things. And the suggestion was, well, there are just people who are just like this, so there's no particular reason to punish them unless their acts are actually dangerous. And since their acts don't seem to be dangerous, why all the persecution? That was the, the argument at the time. At the time, it was still assumed that there would be something fundamentally wrong with people to cause them to be like this, but no one knew exactly what it was. Uh, early Freud, for instance, thought that paranoia was at the root uh, of being queer. Um, and as people have pointed out, if you were a gay man in 1890s Vienna, maybe you had good reasons to be paranoid. <laughs> um, uh, but one of the key things that happened as we get into the early 20th century is that there begin to become enough people visible in major urban areas for the question to shift from being what is the problem with these people to how interesting, what is it that makes these people tick? And the key factor in this, believe it or not, were the demobilizations following the two world wars, and particularly after the first world war for obvious reasons, massive mobilization of men to the armed forces and women to the armaments factory, which meant for the first time a huge number of people from the equivalent of I don't know, name me a nothing place in Massachusetts. Maybe there is no nothing place in Massachusetts. What is the Massachusetts equivalent of Peoria? Don't say Springfield. <laughs> sorry? Well, sorry? Ashburnham, okay. Young, young Joe from Ashburnham who had never seen anyone like him before in life and assumed he was the only gay in the village joined the armed forces and of course uh, at that the, the moment a war comes along all this protest about not having quiz you know, they drop all that and uh, allow people in. So guess what? He found other people like himself. Ditto the women in the armaments factory. And when the war was over, those who survived, which in the case of the First World War was far, far, far too few, uh, those who survived, rather than going back to Ashburnham or Peoria or their equivalents in Germany and England and France, um, went to large cities where they could find other people like themselves because they had discovered that there were other people 
uh, like themselves. And the first real learning melting pot was, was Germany, was Berlin after the First World War. The first sexologists to look at this matter and try to work out what was going on were, were Germans. And for the, during the Weimar Republic, this was the first period of so-called scientific learning. And the first time people would say, huh, okay, we see all these people. There doesn't seem to be anything in particular wrong with them. I wonder what makes them tick. You see the change of the lens from the scapegoating lens to the scientific lens. Now, all of this was interrupted rather brutally when the Nazis took power and immediately burnt all the books, uh, ransacked the libraries, uh, and either killed or exiled the uh, scientists involved. So that learning experiment came to a pretty quick uh, uh, end and therefore then was interrupted by the, the Second World War, after which there was another mass uh, demobilization and this time, thank heavens, at least in America, those who came back went to places like Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York and maybe even Boston. Um, and it was there, actually, in Los Angeles that you got the first uh, sufficient mass of people that the shrinks started to take notice. And famously, you've probably heard of this, famous the Dr. Evelyn Hooker, delightfully named. Um, and she was the... Um, she was... A, a psychologist in, uh, uh, in Los Angeles, and she was challenged by gay friends who said, listen, you, you socialize with us, you know us, you can see us. They say that there is something wrong with us. What is it? Test for it. And she devised a test which came up with the psychological profile of 60 males with all the details that were in the psychological profiles of the era, except for the detail of the sexual orientation of each one of these 60. And then she challenged her profession. She said, listen, you all claim you know what's wrong with the queers. Um, tell us, therefore, which one of these is straight and which one is gay. And you will be surprised to hear that none of them came even close to being able to work out which was which. And when repeated, this became, if you like, the basis of the understanding that we are all as screwed up as each other. But that's quite an important scientific moment, the realization that there is no pathology intrinsic to a same-sex sexual orientation. Does that make sense? No pathology intrinsic. There are minority stress factors, which, as with the case of other minority groups, affect people. But there's no pathology intrinsic to being gay or lesbian. And that, at the time, that was new knowledge. And we can tell how fast that knowledge spread because in the mid-1950s, the British Parliament also decided to conduct a survey onto this question because a lord got caught with a guardsman. And of course, Britain being the sort of place it is, that's the only way to get anything done. Good Lord, one of us caught with a guardsman, we'd better do something about this. Um, so uh, a commission was commissioned. And again, the medical advice at the time, and you can see it quite clearly, says there is no, uh, there appears to be no pathology that is intrinsic to, the, uh, to this orientation. So that was mid-1950s. Mid that had become uh, clear to the medical profession. Then, of course, took 20 or 30 more years to percolate through with all the political shenanigans uh, that you can imagine, to the various psychological associations, because many of them still working from a Freudian model, assuming a trauma-related uh, uh, basis to this, uh, assumed that there must be something wrong, despite what the doctors were, uh, were saying. But, as you know, I think in this country it was 1973, was it? In this country, the American Medical Association and it was in the 1990s with the World Health Organization. Okay, why do I bother you with this history? Well, really, just to remind you that when we think of other cultures and think that they are slow and behindhand on this issue, it's really to remind us that it took us an awfully long time to get to this point. <laughs> with extraordinary economic and social and historical changes of how we coped with families and living in cities 
and small apartments and demobilizations after world wars. <laughs> that was the progress by which we reached the place where we're, where we're able to say, this is not simply a matter of opinion. There is something true here. It is not true that being gay or lesbian is some sort of defect in an intrinsically heterosexual person. It's just something that is what I call a non-pathological minority variant in the human condition. Grand sounding phrase, non-pathological minority variant in the human condition. Like left-handedness is the obvious, is the obvious non-pathological minority variant. Though remember um, uh, that until relatively recently in some places left-handedness was treated as a failure of intrinsic right-handedness and uh, the late king, the current king's grandfather, uh, was forced to uh, write, learn to write with his hand behind his back and it produced a famous, it famously produced a great stammer so that uh, uh, he had to learn how to speak without a stammer with a pebble in his mouth. Um, and that's one of the known complications that arise with people who are forced uh, to left-handedness. You can tell it's hard, it's because it's hardwired, if you go against nature, it produces consequences. <laughs> so the non-pathological uh, minority variant, it's important to learn how to take them seriously. Okay, now, that's a piece of learning that took its sweet time. And of course, it's a piece of learning that um, has run into problems with our Holy Mother, the Church. <laughs> Why? What's been the problem? Well, you know what our church's teaching is with relation to this question. It's that, and I'll see if I can quote this as well as I can from memory. This is from the famous 1986 document, which is the most recent complete statement uh, of this issue, which is that the homosexual tendency, while not itself a sin, is a more or less strong tendency towards acts that are intrinsically evil and therefore it, the tendency, must be considered objectively disordered. Do you remember that? Okay. Now, here's the question. Where did they get that from? Because I'm assuming that most of us here don't go along with that. And I think it's quite important that we understand how we are, how right we are not to go along with that. <laughs> and you can only understand that if we demystify it a little bit and remember where it comes from. Well, it comes from quite simple, single source, which goes back to the second century of our era. So you can imagine that after Jesus and St. Paul, you have a period in which Gentile Christianity is beginning to spread, closely related to some Jewish communities, but also amongst Gentiles. It no longer has the code of Torah to give it as a basis, a basis for understanding uh, what its law should be, because St. Paul has taught us that it's not what is lawful that matters, but what is appropriate, the beginnings of our understanding of natural law is it's not what lawful matters, it's what, what's good for humans. That's the key thing. <laughs> That's the point of natural law. That we get that in St. Paul. And so the best, the most learned people at the time try to work out, okay, what is the, what is the best thing for humans? And at the time, the best thinkers were uh, uh, Platonists and Pythagoreans and in particular the school of Alexandria, where a Jewish philosopher called Philo had been very keen uh, in this area. And Philo was definitely a pretty homophobic guy. He was the one who introduced the notion that fertility was the reason why homosexuality was, was wrong, which was not part of the biblical tradition at all and was not accepted by the, uh, his fellow rabbis. The, as you know, the... Uh, the Jewish tradition on the purpose of marriage is for companionship, not for procreation. The first meaning is given is because God 
thought these people shouldn't be alone. <laughs> so he made someone to be their companion. But anyhow, because of Philo, one of his distant pupils, Clement of Alexandria, with a rather hard line of the time, introduced what is basically the Christian code since then, which is the Creator has shown us that reproduction, sexual reproduction, is a good thing because it's the only way in which the human race survives. Therefore, the sex act, when it is open to reproduction between married spouses is a good thing. Everything else is bad. Okay, does that sound familiar? Because basically that's been the, the song that's ruled the roost since then. At the time, of course, it was assumed that the sex act and the uh, procreation were inherent with each other, that actually, unless you interrupted it somehow, you would have a uh, a baby, that the two were part of the same act. That was Their biology at the time was, let us say, interesting. Um, just to give you an idea, they had inherited their ideas of biology from Aristotle, um, who was a very, very fine, not only a very fine philosopher, which is famous, but a very fine marine biologist, for which he's less famous. But amongst the things he'd observed as a marine biologist is that certain species of amphibians on the Aegean coast um, their offspring are male or female depending on the direction of the wind and the degree of humidity, which is an extraordinary piece of observation if you think about it. He had noticed that when the wind is in a certain direction and the humidity is X or Y, then their offspring are male, and if it's in the southerly direction and the humidity is different, then it's female offspring. His mistake was assuming that you can say the same thing about humans. <laughs> but for a very, very long time, way into the late Middle Ages and beyond, this was the assumption about humans, that the female was the simple seedbed. She made no uh, contribution to the reproductive process. The man planted homunculi into the seedbed. And then, depending on the uh, weather circumstances, either a perfect human would be born, i.e. a male, <laughs> or an imperfect human would be born, i.e. a female. Please, I'm not making this up, okay? This is just to uh, remind us of where, where the state of things were in terms of understanding uh, the ethical world. For Clement of Alexandria, in addition, there was the fact that sexual pleasure was considered very dubious, uh, because of the association with Greek gods like Eros and Aphrodite. So given that those gods didn't exist and were in fact demons, there was something fishy about enjoying yourself too much. So he specifically taught that if a husband gave pleasure, pleasured his wife, then he was turning her into a whore or an adulteress. So just, uh, just again, just so you know where we are with these things. And as you know, the a battle against sexual pleasure didn't really start fading out until the end of the 19th century. <laughs> pleasure was a bad thing. Um, but remember, the reason I bring that up in this circumstance is, is that it means that at no stage was there actual any attempt to study what people like us actually are. All there was was a deduction concerning acts negative deductions from a good act. The good act, the marital act, open to procreation. Anything else, bad. That's where they get the notion of the intrinsically evil act. And intrinsically evil doesn't mean especially evil. It doesn't mean particularly woo-makingly evil. It just means however often you do it, it will never achieve the desired result, which is to have a baby. That's, that's quite literally what it, what it, that's the whole pur purpose of the language of the intrinsic something, which means that however much you do it, it can't do what it's meant to do. That's basically it. <laughs> it's like trying to pump your car wheel with, I don't know, a, a helium balloon or something like that. It won't work. Um, 
Now, I hope you can see that by the time we get into the 20th century, and it begins to become clear, thanks to companionate marriage, and thanks to, uh, frankly, the invention of the pill and of much more effective means of contraception than were available to our uh, early modern uh, ancestors. There, the, the sheep's gut was the most effective condom. Do you remember that? None of you from the sheep's gut era? <laughs> Quite literally, sheep's gut with a, you know, the, the, it's, it, to this day it's used in making sausages. The, the so called skin on sausages is sheep's gut. Just think, okay, it's a nice thing to think of every time you. <laughs> but anyhow, it's worthwhile remembering. Um, but so you can imagine that, that uh, the discovery of, of latex was a huge, made a huge difference to, to an awful lot of things, as well as the discovery of what is the active principle? Is it medsifrone? The active principle in the pill? I forget. But anyhow, by the, by the mid 20th century, there were relatively safe and easily acceptable methods of contraception. And guess what? That meant straight people began to say, well, the old teaching concerning our relationships, well, we are perfectly capable of having relationships that are open to procreation, as the church teaches, but we're also perfectly capable of having relationships that are not open. And guess what? We can choose when we have it or not. And as you know, this led to a great crisis at the time of the Second Vatican Council, when the Pope, after having entrusted the matter to a big commission, decided to settle in favor of the Clement of Alexandria line, which is that every act must be open to procreation. Therefore, no artificial means of contraception were allowed. You remember that. Now, the interesting thing was that during that argument, during that discussion, he was approached by a very distinguished French Jesuit called Gustave Martelet, and Gustave Martelet said to him, Holy Father, if you allow the link between the procreative and the unitive function of sex to be severed, the procreative, having baby, the unitive, giving each other a good time, loving each other, if you allow that to be severed, the church will have no logical reason to teach against homosexuality. And of course, logically, he's absolutely right. But it's not only the fact that logically he's right that I want to bring your attention to, but the fact that it revealed that even by that time, in the mid to late 1960s, the teaching was never about the people concerned. It was always a negative deduction. And this has been the crisis for church's teaching authority since then in relation to straight people. It's had its own uh, crisis and lost completely, as you know. Uh, in the case of us, it's tried harder because, as you all know, again, the matter touches the clerical structure much more directly than straight sex. <laughs> uh, married straight clergymen a few. <laughs> Let's say no more. Um, But what that has meant is that since then, we've been faced with a position whereby the church can no longer talk about the acts by themselves because the people are talking, starting to say about who we are. So in 1975, for the first time, they literally it's the first time in church history that the word homosexual has appeared in a church document a public church document, no doubt it appeared in private uh, church documents before, but a public church document, where the teaching repeated the prohibition on the act as being intrinsically evil, no surprise there, but then said some people are daring to say that the condition itself may be neutral or even positive, are giving a benign, an overly benign interpretation to, <laughs> to the fact, and this mustn't be done. They didn't say any more than that at the time. But by 1986, they'd found the way to close the circle of their argument because they realized that you can't have intrinsically evil acts if the people just are that way. If people just are that way, then the acts presumably have some function that is to do with what the people are. 
You see the problem for them? That's within, just within Catholic thinking. So they came up with this master plan to short circuit the whole system by saying, okay, it's not only that the acts are wrong, but the very fact that you want to do the wrong sort of acts is a sign that your whole pattern of desire is objectively disordered. Hence that phrase I quoted you at the beginning. The acts are wrong and the uh, tendency itself must be considered to be objectively disordered. So at that fatal point, they were saying, we know better than you who you are. Do you see the, the problem? That they had they finally, they had come to a, reach a, a statement that frontally confronted, if you excuse the language, um, what we had learnt over the last 400 years, <laughs> and which was relatively recent knowledge by then, but which is that there just is such a thing as being gay or lesbian, and that it is in itself no kind of defect in an intrinsically heterosexual person. Why did they do that? The answer, apart from this, is because they have no other starting point. <laughs> there is quite literally nothing in divine revelation in scripture or tradition that is about this matter other than from that deductive starting point that I described to you and then borrowing little bits of scripture that they found that seemed to suit their argument and the throwing them into the fire as well as kind of offstage noise like stuff about Sodom or Leviticus. Uh, even though at that stage no one really knew what those texts meant and now we know what they mean. We know that they have nothing to do with <laughs> or at least we know most of what they mean. There are one or two that are still just, no one knows what they mean, but the, uh, they're just difficult to understand. But it means that literally they've got a vacuum of teaching at, the, at this point. This is the problem. And they know it. What have we got? We've got cultural learning that has reached a stage whereby it's perfectly clear that this is not going to go away. It's not a, if you like, a a weird piece of, um, how do you say, depraved Western self-indulgence that we have discovered this. It just appears to be something true. And off the record, these guys know it. They know it in the Vatican. They know it, the Pope certainly knows it. <laughs> Any of them who have had experience of anything other than very tight little bubbles knows this. They also know that culturally, this piece of learning is not yet available in all sorts of places. And this was why I was very pleased to see that when the Pope responded quite gently to the African Cardinal, he said, yes, 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 well, we, we keep fiducia supplicans, but um, we must treat this matter as a cultural matter. It's huge. Hardly anybody noticed that. But the very fact that he's treating this matter as a cultural matter rather than a matter of divine revelation <laughs> seemed to me to be the most significant thing. If you're treating it as a cultural matter, basically you're saying, yes, and the fact is that you in Africa, over the next few years, your gay and lesbian population will become more visible, as it is trying to become now, and you will learn how to cope with it, <laughs> which is obviously the way that things are going, because they are going through the same sorts of processes of industrialization, leaving the countryside, coming to cities, uh, private dwellings, all the kind of things that we went through in 400 years, they're going through in about 40, <laughs> with all the uh, sh cultural shifts that you would expect, and all the uh, fast learning and the panic reactions and the moral crises uh, that such things produce. Okay. Well, where has, this, where has this left us? Well, it's left us in a position where, as you can tell, over the last, basically for the, the last half, uh, the last quarter above all of the 20th century was a particularly dire and sad period for us. Why? Because it was a period of such change in this area in the church that those who had for pious reasons, tried to avoid being gay by joining the clergy at a time when it was the safest place to be gay. 
in the old-fashioned world, the don't ask, don't tell world, in which civil society was a great deal crueler and nastier than it was, we go back to the beginning of the 20th century, we're talking about blackmail, murder, and syphilis, lots of syphilis. Um, uh, these things were not easy <laughs> at the time. A difficult and dangerous, difficult and dangerous uh, world. So if you were pious and you didn't thrill to the adventure of the hunt, as John Gielgud used to say, um, uh, you, uh, uh, the clergy, whether in its male or female version, was the safest place to be. What you had during the course of the 20th century, of course, was the beginning of the 20th century. You start getting novelists, poets, people beginning to speak in their first person. So you start getting some sense of people being able to talk in their first person about this, rather than everything being only about acts. So there being nothing to tell, <laughs> except perhaps in confession. But as it became clear that people were starting to become what we would now call gay or lesbian, to be able to actually be able to talk in the first person. And at the same time, you got the shift in civil society whereby civil society became ever more tolerant. And then eventually, of course, after Stonewall and all that, the process of decriminalization uh, began to spread ever more widely in our countries. Well, at that time, it meant that what used to be unsafe gradually became safer. And what used to be the what I would call a bland hypocrisy rather than a hard hypocrisy in a don't ask, don't tell world, started to become a demanded hypocrisy. Since in a genuinely don't ask, don't tell society, then it's not particularly different whether you're in the clergy or not. <laughs> but in one where it's possible to start being honest and don't ask, don't tell is enforced within the clergy, then that starts to become a real problem of conscience uh, for people and indeed produce serious cognitive dissonance. And I think we all lived with the fruits of a higher clergy in extreme cognitive dissonance. Um, it's still the case uh, with some of the, uh, your Burke appointees uh, in, in, the, in, in, in this country uh, at the moment. But the in the Frédéric Martel's book, he describes the cardinals around John Paul II, in which every one of them was of this sort. Every one of them. People with and sometimes quite benign and sometimes really very, very violent double lives. The only one who didn't have a double life, as far as we know, was, was Ratzinger. But literally all the others were people in this cognitive dissonance and of course, they were the ones who most virulently and violently attacked <laughs> uh, homosexuality. And indeed, one of the reasons why the current Pope has been able to be as sane as he has in this is because they virulently attacked him <laughs> when he was Archbishop of, of Buenos Aires, when he started showing signs, for instance, of suggesting that maybe uh, civil unions could be allowed uh, he was offering that to the Argentinian Senate instead of marriage. Uh, and of course, the, the grand old closet queens rained down on him with ire that made Sodom look like a 4th of July fireworks party. Um, and their principal associate uh, in Argentina was, let us say, an extremely conservative clergyman of, let us say, certain heirs who mysteriously seemed to be constantly surrounded by rather beautiful young men. So, in other words, the usual, the usual story. But it, it, it means that Francis picked up firsthand that this is, this is crazy. And this is how the system works, which is one of the reasons he has had so little tolerance for such people uh, in Rome and has attacked the rigidi uh, and refers to, in fact, in, in, there was a Disney Plus interview with young people that he gave uh, a few months ago, in which one of the young people actually asked him about this. And he said, sí, 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 son infiltrados que se escudan en la enseñanza de la iglesia para cubrir sus propios problemas personales. So these are infiltrators who uh, shield themselves in the teaching of the church to cover up their own personal problems. So in other words, I never expected to hear the Pope say that. 
<laughs> but he did. <laughs> so, in other words, he understands the, the, the way this has gone. And he also understands, and this is what I want to bring up with you and with us after fiducia supplicans, he understood the challenge that it is going to be to move on on this subject. Because we are not dealing with an issue that is capable of rational discourse <laughs> in certain areas. This is why I think that Fiducia Supplicans was an extremely brave uh, gesture of his part. Just before we get that, let's, let's explain something of what's been happening during the synodal process, which you've, which you've uh, known, because uh, you probably observed that there was the Synod in Rome, there were lots of uh, delegates, including people like Jim Martin, who you know, and Cynthia um, Haven Brown from, uh, from Minnesota. Wonderful people. The Pope chose really very, very splendid uh, people. And yet, with the dead weight of many, many bishops from many, many countries, uh, they were, well, and some of the, some of the some friends of mine who were members there have told me something else. Some of, some of them were. Anyhow, never mind. Um, <laughs> um, the, it looked apparently, and this was the photo the press said, that they didn't, weren't able to use the word LGBT and things like that. And people say, oh, how disappointing, blah, 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 that we were expecting, you know, a nice hug. Uh, uh. But in fact, if you look at the, closely at the text, I think quite wisely, the, the people there said, listen, we're happy not to mention LGBT if that causes you scandal in Africa, that's no problem. But we will say that the teaching concerning gender identity and sexual orientation really does need to be reimagined starting from the deliverances of modern psychology and science. In other words, inductively. There has got to be inductive learning in this area. And of course, the Vatican too had said there must be inductive learning in this area. But in this particular field, it had got blocked. The whole of the Humanae Vitae thing blocked because it was left at a purely a prioristic uh, level. But and it was interesting that that particular paragraph got something like 87% votes. In other words, a huge majority of those present who said this teaching must now be looked at using inductive methodology. Um, that, that, that's not exactly the language they used, but effectively that's what it meant. And then later on it said, and this must be done with, you know, confidential meetings, with people able to speak frankly, and in some of these issues it needs to be involving the people themselves in the first person. That's hugely important, because finally they were saying, yes, so far we have been talking about a they, even though many of the we are in fact the they, but we have disguised it. <laughs> um, but at last they're actually saying, no, this must be done now with, uh, with first person witness. And that's hugely important for, especially for trans people, because of the, number, the amount of rubbish that the church has been talking about trans people without paying any attention at all to uh, the scientific uh, consensus on these, on these matters is, has been astounding. So that happened before fiducia supplicans. Now, obviously, that's going to be require more study by the various groups in the Synod, and will no doubt come back in um, October this year. They'll be talking about it some more. But it's obvious that the Pope felt that he wanted to give a bit of a nudge to the whole thing, <laughs> which is why he came up with fiducia supplicans, or he um, pushed his new cardinal prefect uh, Cardinal Fernandez into coming up with fiducia supplicans. And I think of fiducia supplicans much more as an, an event than as a text. I don't know if you've, any of you have actually read it, but if you have, it spends most of the time saying that it's not changing anything. In fact, if something says, I'm not changing anything often enough, you begin to wonder <laughs> Whether, whether it isn't trying to hide something. <laughs> but in fact, what it was doing, I think rather brilliantly, is while not changing anything at all, 
changing the whole direction of the discussion. Because, I think that the Holy Father knows this perfectly well, this issue has been uh, the source of schism or potential schism in every church that's attempted to deal with it. And the only way that it has been survived by churches that haven't attempted to deal with, with it, like the Orthodox churches, is by them using Nazis and skinheads to beat up people, um, to beat up people at gay pride marches in Serbia and Russia and places like that. In other words, either you start to deal with it or you, you uh, with physical violence, you stop it. But there is no Christian body that has managed just to say, oh, well, we'll, we'll sail through this easily, except perhaps the Quakers. I think probably the Quakers were the first to, to do that. But as you know, the Quakers are a tiny, uh, a tiny and very morally significant group, but they are a, a very small group. Everyone else, this issue has been a source of potential schism. And the Holy Father has somehow got to keep the ship going. But what he's done, I think, in a quite a simple gesture, is turned a minus sign into a plus sign. He's saying, nothing changes, but now you are to be for these people. <laughs> Even if it's a little 15 second blessing, and I'm sure, dare I say it, I imagine that you have had bigger blessings for same-sex couples here in St. Cecilia. Or if not here, then off the record in some cupboard down the street. Even full marriages. <gasps> All these things which, and those will continue, of course, I'm quite sure. But he's saying, the key thing in this is that nothing changes, but you must now be able to bless people. And of course, that is terribly shocking for a clerical formation system which has been this is your enemy. It's your enemy inside yourself. Hide it at all costs. You cannot bless outside yourself what you are torturing yourself within. <laughs> With the result that you've seen the allergic reaction. And I think that it's worth considering that it's an allergic reaction. It's not a rational reaction. It's the allergic reaction of schism, the collapse of everything that is holy. But for the first time in my life, and I suspect in your life as well, since many of us are roughly the same age. Um, the church's teaching has been on the pro-LGB side, LGBT side, of producing the allergy, rather than on the negative side. In other words, for the first time, it's those people who are against, who have to justify themselves <laughs> with church authority, not those people who are for. And I cannot tell you what a huge psychological difference I think that is going to make over time. Because effectively he's saying, yep, this is going to produce a violent allergic reaction. But the violent allergic reaction will <laughs> gradually dial itself down. As people A, get used to it on the one hand, but B, because those people who get really violently uh, uh, allergic to it, make themselves ridiculous. And that's one of the things which we've all seen. I don't know whether you remember reading about this during the, during the Synod, but there was a, a Syrian archbishop who discovered that he was sitting at the same table as Jim Martin and literally went into an allergic fit. The thought that he might be photographed next to this source of worldwide contamination was so great that he rushed out of the uh, out of the Vatican Hall and wouldn't come back for the rest of the, uh, of the Synod. Now, no one thought, what a good and holy man and what a sensible thing to do. <laughs> they all thought, honey, I wonder what's got her. Uh, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> well, come on, one doesn't have to be a genius, you know. <laughs> So we live in a RuPaul world, everything is... <laughs> and that's the thing, the allergic reaction gives itself away by being too, uh, too over the top. And that in fact has often been how we have moved along in these things, by the people having such a bad reaction that actually they give themselves uh, away. But so that's going to be one of the interesting things. 
is now that I think he's, he's, run, he's run a risk and I'm sure that he received more hatred on this issue than on any other because this touches so many nerves within, as you know, the clerical system and within those who need the church as a perfect, unchanging pyramid of, of power deductions from, from a badly misunderstood St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, those people, of course, are deeply scandalized because the Holy Father clearly understands we have learned something true and this must be able to move on. In fact, he gave even one of the best replies because afterwards, I can't, don't know whether you saw this here, but there was a whole discussion afterwards about whether he was allowing people to bless them as couples or whether he was blessing their union. And never have so many different uh, nuances have been attached to the words couple and union uh, as the, the desperate attempts to rescue orthodoxy from, from the hands of the Holy Father. But then the Holy Father, when he was asked about this, said, he said, well, of course, you're blessing their love. <laughs> Best possible answer. <laughs> Best possible answer, because, of course, that's what's true. If people have discovered that they are a blessing to each other through love, then they want to bless. And their friends want to bless God with them because they recognize that God is blessing them through the gift which they are to their wider community. So it makes perfect sense. <laughs> but I thought this was a brilliantly simple answer by, uh, by the Holy Father. Of course you, you bless them. You're blessing their love. And, ah, genius. Pure genius. Just a little word. Little word. That's what he's done so often. It's just these tiny little... It's these tiny little nudges that have done it. He knows perfectly well that to take on the whole thing. No, you're dealing with a very, very frightened, uh, a very, very frightened uh, clerical superstructure um, that is, well, I think this is in the, the situation which we've all faced at one stage of beginning to be aware of the shame attached to the old position, but not being able to move out, move out of it. I think that part of our job is to unshame people, those of us who have been through shame ourselves. I hope that we are in a position to be able to stand up and unshame others rather than leave them and push them into the situation of shame. But I think that we are going to have um, an important role standing up and giving witness from this period onwards because remember the church has no mechanism by which it can change teaching in this area. The only mechanism is the production by the Holy Spirit of witnesses such that people are able to say they're just like us. We have seen, this is what Peter noticed about the Gentiles, the Gentiles when the Holy Spirit fell upon them in Acts 10. The Holy Spirit fell on them and he said, they have received the Holy Spirit just like us. Who am I to withhold baptism? Uh, from them. And I think that that is the, the thing, which is why I'm so keen, why I told you a bit of the history. So I'm very keen on, on us having the strength of conscience to be able to stand peacefully. <laughs> and as the allergic frightened are gradually able to see, actually the church is not going to collapse just because we start blessing gay and lesbian people. And of course we're going to do far, far more than blessing. It would be miraculous for them to be able to do it in Malawi because at the moment they're busy trying to, to actually kill people. But here we can have weddings quietly. The key thing would be don't cause scandal. And then little by little, the learning will be able to be socialized. The realization that we are the bearers of a non-pathological minority variant and therefore that grace will perfect our nature, turning us, we hope, into generous givers and blessers of others. Does that make sense? I was asked whether how this, how this looks like in other places, because I'm aware that one of the... It's, a really, it's really, really tough to be American and Catholic. Much tougher, I think, than in most places because you have a, 
particularly legalistic, um, particularly legalistic episcopacy. But then it's it's one of your national characteristics, if you excuse my saying so. I mean, you have a particularly legalistic police system and frontier system and sorry, sue the bastard. Yeah, and it's uh, you're a, a people of laws and laws. <laughs> Um, and that's wonderful in many ways, but complicated in others. Um, the image which I use, um, and I've used this in talks before, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, is have any of you ever driven a car in Italy? Yes? It's uh, quite a fun uh, experience. Um, Italy, of course, has complete traffic legislation, which, like all traffic legislation, covers every eventuality, and it is adhered to by precisely no one. Um, Italian drivers are very, very good drivers because prudential drivers tend to be better than legal drivers, legalistic drivers, because you're used to unexpected things happening, like there being no signposting in the street and no lines anywhere. Um, but so traffic ducks in and out. But then there are Italian traffic cops, and Italian traffic cops have beautiful uniforms. Um, one of the a real eye candy of visiting Italy is observing Italian traffic cops. So every now and then Italian traffic cops come out of wherever it is that they're admiring themselves in their uniforms, and they stand on podiums in the middle of the street, and they point fingers and blow whistles and look very elegant. And of course, this has catastrophic effects on the traffic, which immediately slows down terribly in order to be seen to be obeying for at least the 50 yards it takes to get past. And then, after a bit, honor is satisfied, and the cop, he's been out in the sun for a little bit, and he puts back his hat on, and back he goes to honor is satisfied, and everything goes back to, to normal. OK, now, remember that that is how the Vatican works. And they say this, they say this is quite well, you know, we have to shout, we have to shout loud enough to wake up the Italians, but not so loud that we cause the Americans to commit suicide. And, uh, so they are well aware of the, uh, the difficulty of doing this, because the whole of the Catholic thing depends on prudence, which means that all these teachings are there and they're to be navigated around. What Protestants call hypocrisy, we call prudence. And I think that the real, the real challenge, because I think one of the things that is, is most difficult, is cruelest for you, is that in a genuinely Protestant world, there are very, very, very few moral teachings, and they are to be, they are to be taken very, very, very seriously. And in the Catholic, well, there is a huge plethora of moral teachings, all of which have to be navigated with considerable skill. But in the United States, you have the worst of all possible worlds. Catholic teaching held with a Protestant conscience. In other words, apply the whole damn thing seriously! And don't allow LGBTQ groups at high school! And fire people who are not in completely regular situations if they ever use a condom! Or whatever you know it, yeah. So I think it's a, it's a hugely challenging. Thing. I think you have you have a tougher time here, being Catholics, and I think anybody, because of the sheer threat of the Protestant conscience forcing you to apply Catholic teaching in a way that it was never designed but to be implied. And of course, your bishops seem to have decided they seem to suffer from evangelical envy uh, and want the kind of the moral heft that goes with the money and the power and the being right and all of that. Terrible. It's a tragedy. But in this area, at least in the Spanish-speaking world, there's lots of moving on. There's lots of moving on on this. One of the, I mean, I've gone back and forth to Mexico over many years. The number of different dioceses in Mexico that now have bishop-supported LGBT-friendly groups where they specifically don't apply courage and uh, these things, saying, no, 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 forget courage. Courage, there was a, there was a, they went through a courage phase about 
until about 10 years ago because North America exported courage to, uh, uh, to Mexico. Uh, but it didn't really work uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and so now there are a number of very, very fine groups. I think that there's something like 19 of the 26 uh, states of, of the United Mexican States, uh, now very fine groups. And the bishops are gradually getting, you know, they, they picked up Francis's message. Many of them wanted to move on anyhow, but now, they're, now that they can see that Rome is happy with this, then they're happy with it. They don't seem to be in a, locked in a stage of, uh, we've got to fight for the Catholic faith against the Pope, uh, which seems, dare one say it, to be a certain, <laughs> a certain thing uh, that's, uh, that's going on here. There are, there are difficulties with this, of course, and you know, different European countries are going through the, uh, the the results of the complete loss of credibility of the clergy because of the abuse crisis. I'm not bringing coals to Newcastle, I'm not bringing spotlight to Boston, um, but that's now been affecting everybody else uh, in different ways. The Spaniards are just beginning to wake up to this, um, but it means that their credibility is shot to pieces. And they're beginning to become aware that their credibility is shot to pieces. And they really genuinely have no idea how to move on at the moment. So, interesting times. We appear to be coming to the end of Pope Francis's period, though may he live many, many years longer and surprise us all and be given new health. <laughs> um, who will come next? We don't know. But the important thing, I think, is us being able to stand up and bear witness speaking truthfully, and not being frightened as the allergic reaction tamps down. Sorry if I've gone on too long and thank you very much for putting up with me. Thank you. And please feel free to answer questions. Ask questions, sorry, and answer them if you like. Um, alas, no, I will be in Milwaukee. How do you earn a living? By wandering around and doing things like this. I used to be a Dominican and I left them and became an itinerant mendicant preacher. <laughs> I've been supported by um, a grant following the thought of René Girard. So I've had, I've had some income from that and other things that I earn from particularly, you know, universities, Episcopalian churches, they're the ones to get invited to give talks to. <laughs> Never seen so much money in my life. <laughs> Episcopalian churches, uh, Wall Street, Trinity Wall Street. They own Wall Street. Can you believe it? They're the people to get invited. <laughs> so. The double life causes and is caused by, yes. Could you say more about that, please, more directly? Well, which scandal are you talking about? Uh, the clergy sex scandal. Oh, the child abuse scandal. Yes, people have, I mean, as you know, at least in this country, when it started, because you were one of the first people out of the gate as the, as the messenger of this thing, which we've all had to learn about since as being uh, a worldwide thing. Um, there was an attempt at the time by John Paul's hench persons to link paedophilia and homosexuality uh, together and indeed to forbid people to separate them. But luckily that didn't last long and one of the good things about Ratzinger was that he did call in scientists <laughs> and ask them to clarify, uh, to clarify this and they explained to him and to the Vatican that there is no intrinsic link between <laughs> homosexuality and paedophilia. Now, Structurally, and this is a point which Frédéric Martel made in his book and which I subscribe to as well, there is a link, but of a different sort. And it's the link that goes along with structural mendacity, meaning a structure of lies. If our clerical formation structures typically are, which they are, 
don't ask, don't tell in this area. And that, of course, was even tightened when it suddenly they said no gay people are allowed to be in the priesthood, which meant that all the gay people had to pretend even harder not to be gay, or at least they had to play wink, wink, nudge, nudge with their seminary uh, teachers and all of that. But if the one rule is do not let your intimacy become visible, whether you're straight or gay, then the general rule of clerical life, and this is mean until very recently, has been this is a glass house in which we don't throw stones. In other words, there's been a false mercy surrounding this. And because of that false mercy, for quite a long time, people were unable or unwilling to distinguish between something which is naughty, according to church teaching, but in fact adult and non-criminal, and something which is pathological and criminal. Because the general thing is, you know, I don't want to know about this. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> Just think how many bishops have not wanted to know about things. Because then they might have to do something about it. And they didn't want to do something about it because they knew or thought that it was something homosexual. <laughs> and only later did they discover that it was actually something <laughs> of a quite a different sort. So I think that there has been a structural uh, link, but it's not to do either with celibacy or indeed with sex at all. It's been to do with dishonesty, <laughs> a culture in which everyone had to be dishonest about intimacy. And until people can be formed in honesty, which is one of the things I think the Holy Father is now trying to get with seminary formation, having many more women involved in seminary formation, um, precisely serves to try and avoid these people who have learnt how to play the game so as to survive and get on. What uh, a friend of mine who spent some years at the English college, uh, not the English college, the North American college, told me what they call the submarine policy, which is you arrive, you become a submarine. Cause no waves, do not be seen, do not come up for air until you're ordained. And then the bishop's got to put up with you. But of course, people who do that have learned how to be duplicitous. And they're always going to be duplicitous, thinking that they are preserving a little bit of space for their honesty, but they're always going to be duplicitous. So I think that there is a, I think there has been a problem. This has been, this has been well done by sociologists who've studied, who've studied this. There's actually a very good book in, um, in Italian, it's been translated into French, called La Casta dei Casti, an Italian sociologist who studied seminaries in the north of Italy, current and past members, rectors, students, and so forth. And he went in there as a sociologist, assuming that he was going to find that the, change, the church produced predators. And he said, no, there are no more predators here than anywhere else. But what the church does produce is liars. Everybody has to lie in order to survive the formation system. And that is one of the things that then means that everybody's first reaction when, when one of these issues comes up is cover up. Cover up, protect the honor of the church, whatever. You've, you've seen how it, all, how, how it all works. So, but I think that, you know, obviously that is not something that's gonna be easily resolved while the church still teaches nonsense about its own gay employees. <laughs> It's only if they can be honest, which in some religious congregations they can be, but even so, the religious congregations have superiors who have to pay attention to bishops and all of that. So there's a regular old dance that goes on. Uh, but, uh, but I think that that is a real, a real issue. Does, it, does that kind of answer that? It actually answers the question better than I had hoped for. Ah, Please do. about the honesty, in what way is my answer interspersed with scripture? Well, um, what you hear, what you hear whispered <laughs> will be shouted aloud on the street. <laughs> I think that that's one of the things our Lord says on the one hand, but also the other one, which is blessed are you who are not scandalized by me. In other words, the not being scandalized by Jesus 
looks like not being hardline. People were scandalized by him because he was not sufficiently hardline. It's people who are able to move out of a sacrificial world in which all the rules work into a world where none of that really matters, who are not scandalized by him. And I think that that's where we're going with this. Well, our Lord says, is whatever is, he's referring to the fact that the things that will be whispered quietly will become public knowledge. And I think that we're talking here about something that has long been whispered quietly and has in fact become public knowledge. <laughs> and there will no doubt be other things in future. But once it's public knowledge, then people have to look around and say, okay, yeah, we've been caught, guys. <laughs> Why have we been so ashamed of the reality of who we are? Let's... Let's just get on with trying to be good priests and... <laughs> Does that make sense? Sir? Trying to be good priests, how would the church support a healthy intimacy in seminary? Mm. Uh, yeah. It's a lovely question that's way above my pay grade, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think that that is one of the uh, the billion dollar questions for a start. As you know, they're, they're not getting many seminarians and many of the ones they are getting are precisely the ones who want to close down, uh, want to close down universe. Um, and a world where there are fixed and rigid securities and um, queenly dress codes. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how that's going to be dealt with. I don't know how that's going to be dealt with. Um, I know that attempts are being made. The Spanish bishops were hauled off to, to Rome en masse to be lectured about seminaries because Rome was seeing the production of these basically purely minority political ghetto, <laughs> ghetto priests in an entirely conservative bubble who were completely useless for communicating the gospel to the wider, uh, wider public. And you know, I can understand it. It's it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to know what it would actually look like to be living a public evangelical life currently, if you're not allowed to be honest about matters gay, amongst other things, or about the place of women. And given that seminarians are going to be recruited from from people who, by definition, don't mind that women aren't allowed to be in the seminary, so they're likely to be of a certain misogynistic <laughs> sort and don't mind that they're not allowed to be openly gay, therefore they're going to be homophobic. Well, you're going to have a, a class of priests that is going to be severely limited in their public capacity to, <laughs> uh, to minister. You know, as, as it were, what used to be simply a normal fact of don't ask, don't tell, and the fact that, that women, women weren't priests was just part of the social order, while it's part of the social order, it matters much less. The moment it becomes an ideological choice, but that's where we are now. Do you see any place in, in the world where they would want to find that? Not yet. I haven't seen any place because the, the problems are basically the same everywhere. And I have been quite, quite ways around the world. At least I have seen places where the public discussions are beginning to happen more. I was in Australia in September and October at the invitation of the Catholic religious and indeed hosted by a couple of archdioceses to speak openly about these matters in public to the, the, to the seminary, to the priests, to the Catholic principals, to the migrants groups. And so I noticed real signs of intelligence. They realize that they've got to they've got to move with this. And really the interesting thing was that the most interesting was that they realized they have very significant migrant populations, in this case from South Asian countries mostly, and some from African. But the first, the first generation of the migrant tends to become more conservative than their home background. But then of course their children go to school in Australia and become modern Australians, and then enter into terrible culture shock with their ethnic uh, expression 
uh, and the ethnic form of Catholicism. Uh, and so the church mercifully has re recognized rather than simply making opportunistic use of the migrants to justify a hardline church, which unfortunately has been done in some, in some places, is to say, actually, we've got to help these people um, keep their families together, which means learn, helping them broaden into a, a wider understanding of, for instance, the fact that some of their kids are going to be LGBT. <laughs> Um, so I was hugely struck by how wise uh, some people, at least, are there. I mean, there are all sorts, of course, but at least uh, the discussions were happening. It's a beginning. It's a beginning. It's a beginning. It's about fifty years too late, but it's a beginning. <laughs> so. The answer is I don't know. I know I mean, numerically he's now it's now two, two, more than two thirds are his appointees, but I think that he's been very. I, I have the impression that he very genuinely trusts the Holy Spirit in this because I don't think he's appointed people on ideological basis. I think if anything he's appointed on geographical basis. He wanted many more from not the traditional, uh, you know, Catholic capitals. So you have places of cardinals from much smaller countries than have ever had cardinals before. Um, and we'll have to see because I think that one of the difficulties of course is that these guys are so far flung that most of them don't know each other. So what's it going to be like for them to get to know each other before deciding if any of them is up to the job of being? So the answer is I don't know. And he's been, he's tended not to be brutal in his uh, doing of these. He's been very slow. I mean, I think, curiously, the only person he was more or less brutal with was Cardinal Burke. Uh, when at the very beginning of his, he moved him straight from, from the, the uh, Rota and from, from appointing bishops in your country, because I think he, he had realized quite what disaster some of those. Uh, but I think that in general, he's been, well, and then Strickland, but then of course, you're talking about the, the extraplanetary by that point. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> no, sorry, uh, there's a, we must have a female voice behind you. We must have a woman, please. Yes. We have a question from someone online. Can you comment on the matter of community groups as we learn more and more about the kinds of people and the kinds of people that the organizational pressure is widely marginalizing and Hmm. Um, well, as you know, the discussion is only just beginning, and it's beginning in terms of deacons. Uh, the Vatican met recently with an Anglican woman bishop to start talking about this. So the signs are at least that they're beginning to, to treat this as a, as, a, as a discussion. This issue is going to be very, very slow. The question of married, that's going to be a financial issue, as it already is. Because typically Catholic Church structures don't allow the kind of salaries and stability of life that is necessary for a married couple who have children, which means schools, which means not changing jobs and places where they live, etc., etc. There are a whole variety of issues that come into play once you have a married clergy, whether of whatever gender, <laughs> um, that are simply not, uh, that's going to require huge rethinking. So I think that that is a financial question. As to the, uh, the way in which women are going to become occupiers of the leadership place that is proper to them, I don't know how that is going to, to happen, but at least we can see the signs that it is, uh, it's, beginning, it's beginning to happen. They're beginning to, to have the discussion. I'm sorry I can't say uh, more about that. Joe, sorry. Western 
Well, isn't it part of the same, the same phenomenon? If something bubbles over, uh, uh, like sexual liberation or whatever in the, um, in the 1960s, then you get some sort of Puritan uh, backlash. And what you don't get is a discussion about what might be considered a virtuous way of life. <laughs> in other words, we've had no discussion of what chastity or poverty or obedience might mean <laughs> outside the strictly clerical uh, sphere with the result that there is a massively legalistic discussion <laughs> about these issues uh, outside the clerical sphere uh, at the moment, as you, as, you, as you say. And to be honest, I think that, you know, that's just part of uh, where there is not a public discussion, the legal will take over. And that's what what I think has happened. And you're right, it's not only here, though it happens with particular vengeance here, but, um, but it's true in Spain, it's true in England, the, the Me Too and the equivalent of the equivalent movements have been very, uh, have been very strong. Um, there is, there have been very serious rows in, in Spain where I live uh, concerning this because sometimes they make the law too, too harsh in one way and then there's a great deal of pressure for them to change it back in another. So those discussions are, are, are ongoing. I think you're right. I think that it was assumed that that, that was the kind of thing that religion looked after. <laughs> but then it doesn't. So now it's being looked after in another sphere. And as you say, without any balancing uh, qualities regarding, uh, regarding mercy and uh, what's the word? People being able to turn a blind eye because now being turning a blind eye is seen as morally uh, morally culpable. So no, I, I I agree with you. I think that we're in a we're in a difficult situation uh, uh, with regards uh, with regards what what is genuinely consensual, when is it genuinely consensual, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything has to be uh, what's the word spelt out uh, in incredible detail. If nothing is unlawful, then what is appropriate? What is convenient in Latin? Convenience. What is suitable for humans? Well, we've discovered that there are some people who are gay and lesbian. And therefore, I think the key question for us is going to be, what is the appropriate form of flourishing for gay and lesbian people? This is not a question that has been asked before. <laughs> the only question that was asked are, why do these people do acts that are evil? <laughs> Does that make sense? But so, so yeah. Well, I think that's right, but I, the, the, I think that the whole idea of ressourcement was precisely to understand each of these people in their circumstances, so you can see what was the arguments that they were... Yes. As, as you know, I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas was, uh, was condemned for heresy in his, li in his lifetime, and, uh, shortly thereafter. Um, once you understand the arguments that are in the background, you understand positions taken much more subtly. Sir. Even this church, this question, why did you become a priest? 
Well, I hope it was because God wanted me to and made, made use of all my immaterial and immature and wrong motives to... <laughs> but I, I discovered more about why I became a priest as I became one over time, I think. Whatever one, whatever one starts with, it's not the same reason that one ends with. I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh yes, you need you need a, you need a microphone. No, I don't. I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'm very brief. Come here. I just I, I you know, there's a bunch of priests here, but I you're fascinating. You're engaging. I feel like things have been stirred up in me. I, you know. Never learned any of this in the seminary, <laughs> uh, although I had a phenomenal, phenomenal professor, Walter Woods, who, who we did an independent study, and he, he got me thinking in these ways, and I'm nowhere near as articulate and uh, intelligent as you, and I, 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 it's just a reality, you're gifted, 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 but I kept thinking while I'm listening, like, that's exactly, you know what I mean? So I, I, I don't know, I, I, and I hope I speak for all of us, like you, you, I think you've said something to us and, and for us. As, as, as we all go forward in our unique roles and, and, and just who we are, and to think of these things in, in, in different ways and deeper ways. Um, well, thank you very, very much. Very yeah. grateful and uh, just so grateful that you guys are well, here in the thank Rainbow Mellon Ministry. Yeah, for I was having... going to say Mellon, James, like the, the whole Rainbow Ministry and all that you guys provide, and it's just it's pro thought provocative, it's engaging, and it's enlivening on so many levels. So thank, well, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much, thank much you for, for being. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for hosting us. Also, Nicole, thank you for you know with the whole uh, the great the great gift of the um, uh, flock that's watching, all of you guys that are joining with us, and Jeff for being so good in, in, in what you do and how you do what you do and bringing us to so many people. So I uh, can't thank uh, every, everybody enough. So. Thanks. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I have no idea. No idea.